What is easiness? What does it mean to be easy? Is it that I just let things go? I let myself go. I let life go. The best analogy that I have for myself as a reference to be easy, to be light, allows me to see things as they are. We all face challenges. We all have to, you know, make a living, put a roof over our head. Um, we're in relationships. We um, will come across misunderstandings, misinterpretations. There won't always be clarity in our communications at work or at home. And so this will make for murky waters. And I seek clarity. So the analogy that works for me is a lake. And when the water of a lake is calm, and specifically the Sierra lakes or mountain lakes, there's something unique about mountain lakes rather than stagnant lakes or lakes that are in lowlands. But for mountain lakes, there's a constant flow, yet the body of the water remains crystal clear. If you think of, well, here in California, our nearby lake would be Lake Tahoe, but there's also some closer lakes that you can visit and you can see to the bottom. It's very clear. And when any body of water is calm, like in the early morning when you go for a walk, what can you see when you look out onto the lake? You see clearly the reflection of the world around you. So not only can you see into the lake, you can see things as they are. And when I peer into the lake, I can see myself as I am. Total acceptance. I can see the blemishes. I'm thinking physically, but introspectively, if we go inward, have that inward reflection, we have the lake of our mind. And so when the mind is calm, my perception will be clear how I perceive what's real. I'm careful with my words because what's reality could be different for different people. I often say that every one of us have different pop-ups. <laughs> you know how you'll have screen pop-ups? You're just, you know, on the computer and all of a sudden a commercial or an ad or a reminder will come up. Maybe you've even scheduled something and you're being reminded. But also when events happen, circumstances or situations, it's like as if something pops up and is projected on what's happening. And I'm not really seeing that scene as it is. So what am I doing? I'm projecting maybe a negative experience that I might have had, let's say with a dog, right? Then I would see all dogs this way. <laughs> or I would see all people from um, this age range this way. <laughs> Oh, all kids are like this. All um, adults are like this. All people from this com country are like that. Oh, all women are like this, right? And so we'll have these like projected images of people that we're not really seeing them as they are. And so when it's turbulent, when the water, the mind, is clouded with sediment, then I'm not seeing things as they are. I, it could even be when I'm too calm, then sediment will rise. 
the water will get stagnant and it'll even grow that algae. So there needs to be that flow. It's a good balance where I'm allowing that flow. And in the case of a mountain lake, there's always snow melt every year. And so there's water coming into the lake, fresh water, and then the, the lake will surrender whatever is excess and release water, but it's very subtle. So I like using that image of the lake that I will learn something new. I'll be receptive. I'll maybe listen to my family member as if I'm listening to them for the first time. To really take that person in. And, and perhaps even have some good wishes for them and loving. Of course, I am loving with them. But let's say they um, are upset with you <laughs> or with me. But I just remain calm. And chances are that calm demeanor will affect the other person. So... Also, another thing can happen is when a traumatic event happens, um, a situation or someone's really upset with you. And so it makes it more difficult to see things as they are. So what would I do at that time? I would want to take that moment, take a deep breath and not react. And go into what I call essence. And I'll talk a little bit more about essence in a bit. But just so that you get this feeling of easiness, there's a balance of where you allow a flow, but you also have clarity. And whether there are storms, I don't want to have stagnation and I don't want to have disturbance. And this can come from within or it can be an external influence. So I want to keep, number one, attention. To be aware. To be aware of how I respond to things or react to things. Um, some people think that's uh, two different words. And, and will you, I, I think really it's the same, reacting or responding. But we tend to think that responding would be um, something from a, a awakened state or you're conscious of what your words are. You're selective about how you would respond. Whereas reacting, you're immediately, you know, just you say, oh, it was my gut feeling. But you got all upset and angry. And then what happens? You'll have a room full of casualties or Maybe it's just one person and they won't see you in the same light the next time you encounter them. Is that really effective? So I want to keep attention to be the observer, to observe how I react with people, to observe my thoughts when I'm by myself and be my best friend, not to judge, but just be the watcher, to just observe, to have attention. And then I begin to see patterns. I'll start to know myself in a different way and understand, oh, I see when this happens, it makes me feel sad. Or when these types of thoughts that I have, I'm happy, I'm calm. So it's like keeping an inventory of your emotions and feelings and how they affect you, how you see the world. And I can begin to choose how I respond to be essenceful, to be light, to be easy. When there's too many thoughts, and I know this from experience, and I have that habit of thinking too much, and so I just watch it. I don't judge because that'll create more, you know, waste thoughts 
if I judge myself for having waste thoughts. <laughs> you see what I mean? So it's a funny game we play with ourselves. But the idea is, you know, to be friends with my thoughts and my feelings and get to know myself just by being the observer, keeping attention, but not having tension. I should have done this. Why wasn't I not? What was I thinking? Right. But to begin to understand myself just as I would a good friend. So I find this very helpful. I'll even find myself saying, okay, wait a minute, Elizabeth. Not that I would say my name out loud. I'm just dramatizing this with you. But I'll just, you know, like, I'll just sort of like, you know, hold my hands or something and I'll go, okay, sweetheart, what is it that you really need? So I'll just ask my, you know, whatever nice endearment you could have for yourself. Why not? <laughs> right? Why not? We, we can be hard with ourselves and have an internal um, conversation that is quite difficult. So why not have a practice of kind words for myself and a an, an conversation with the self? Not that we're two people, but we do have a observer mind and an analytical um, I guess, reasoning um, function, which we call intellect and the um, perception aspect we call the mind. And the mind is innocent. It's just letting you know what's going on. And the intellect will debate, will judge, will discern. And there's a positive when there's a tension. But when I add tension, then it will become waste. And how do I know there's waste? What do you think? I'll unmute if anybody wants to join in on conversation. But when I have waste thoughts, the one thing that I've observed is I will repeat myself. I will say this same thing over and over like an attorney. I'm making points. I'm making my case. I can't believe they said that to me. Do you know what they said to me? You know, they said this. I mean, really? And then again, you go there. <laughs> you know, or I can't believe I did that. And we go over and over. That's tension. That creates tension when we repeatedly um, have harsh thoughts. They, that's a waste of time. Even if it's necessary, if I keep repeating it, you know, because there are observations that are necessary. But if it's over and over, is that necessary? What does it create? It creates tension. I think I got it the first time, or perhaps that other person would have gotten it the first time. And even if I go after, my kids or my pets, uh, and I'm nagging over and over, I've seen the results, you know, when they'll have a trainer, I've seen this with dogs, the dog never uh, behaves, or is obedient to the, um, the owner, and the owner's constantly nagging the dog. And this uh, trainer comes in, and it was on uh, some little video documentary thing. And he comes in and he says, well, you need to talk sweetly to the dog. And you're thinking it's just a dog, right? <laughs> but this trainer starts talking sweetly to the dog and immediately the dog is obedient. And I'm thinking, you know, people are a little more complex only in, you know, complex and only in that it might take a while because they want to sense a sincerity from you. especially if we've been hard on them for a long period of time or on myself for that matter. So I keep attention not to create tension and allow 
flow, just like the lake. So there's an ease. It's not like a big, you know, um, tsunami. I want to clean out the lake. What good would that be? It's a gradual baby steps. And there are great accomplishes, accomplishments made when I just take small steps because that's more encouraging. Oh, wow, I did that today. Oh, okay, I was much calmer when I was with this person today or they got upset with me and I didn't react today. These are what I call baby steps. But with each step, I will reach my goals and do amazing things. So keeping attention, allowing the flow, being receptive to listen, to let go. Now here's another one, to let it go. This creates ease. And why do I want this ease? Because there, when there is clarity, I will see the challenges that life brings all of us, every one of us. And some of the challenges um, are external, but I would say most of them are from the inside out. Again, those pop-ups, which we call impressions, they pop up. So I talked about a function of the mind that perceives, a function of reasoning, the intellect that analyzes, decides, judges. And there's the memory bank of past experiences. And we call these impressions. And I can react or respond based on these impressions. So I want to create good impressions on the psyche by keeping attention, allowing healing, and healing needs flow. Any type of healing, a medical professional or a homeopath or an Ayurvedic practitioner, they encourage flow. Same with our thoughts, not to hold on, you know, just to let things go. We can't hold on to a single minute or a single day. It's not natural. Everything is changing. Everything is moving. But I'm understanding change. I'm, under, I'm kind of doing this with my hand, this kind of cyclic um, motion, because, you know, the whole universe runs in cycles seasons, minutes, into hours, into days, into seasons. And, um, you know, you've heard yourself when a situation happens, oh, here we go again, right? But it isn't until I am receptive to that challenge, to listen to what the lesson is, and to trust to trust that everything that's happening, everything that's happening is happening for the soul, for me. Not at me or to me. So this trust also allows me to have this flow. This flow, this easiness allows clarity and this clarity allows me to see things as they are. To see myself as I am. Total acceptance. Appreciating my own presence. My own peaceful, loving presence. And this is what will help me to handle the challenges, to get a grip, right? <laughs> Can you handle it? So we want to see things as they are. 
and have good perspectives. And, um, you know, there's a little game that we play in the drama of life. And um, it's interesting, if I don't have that attention on myself and allow things to flow, if I resist the lesson, that opportunity that's coming for me, then what happens if I resist it? What happens? Yeah. Whatever comes for me, at me, whatever situation, whatever challenge, if I resist, if I shove it under the rug, if I run away, now it means that it will continue to persist, right? Whatever I resist will persist. Sound familiar? Yeah. And I can fall victim and you'll hear people say that this, you know, this is, uh, you know, didn't used to say this that much 20 years ago, but now you can see that if I'm spinning my wheels, meaning repeating waste about myself, about the weather, about others, um, then it's as if I'm subjective to my environment. I'm powerless. And I just resist what is knocking at the door. And that's what we call victim consciousness. And then whatever you fight, what happens? Oh, yeah, you came knocking on my door. Oh, yeah, right? Roll up the sleeves. <laughs> um, whatever I fight, what happens? I just strengthen it. I can create... Uh, uh, from a fire, a bonfire. So whatever I fight, I strengthen. So whatever I resist, it will persist. Whatever I fight, I will strength, strengthen. And this is sort of that perpetrator. And I'll catch myself. I see myself as a pretty easygoing person, but I'll catch myself. You know, even the other day, someone's trash from their truck was going out onto the freeway. Oh, I got so upset. <laughs> like it was a bunch of cardboard boxes in their trucks and they didn't, and they were actually didn't realize what was happening. And I, to I told the driver, drive up to the car, honk your horn. But I just, yes, I did the needful and it was good because, you know, these huge, you know, cardboard boxes on the freeway. But I, it, I got so worked up you know, and I remember just kind of being like, I don't know, very marmish and how could this happen? And, and it was kind of repeating in my head. And I went, Oh, Elizabeth, you're doing it. You're doing it. Do the needful, do what you have to do, whatever your duty is, your responsibility, but there's no reason to get heated or angry. And when we honked the horn, I could tell they were oblivious. And then they pulled over and dealt with the situation. So I call this, you know, fighting uh, like the perpetrator. Sound familiar? Victim, perpetrator, and what's next? When you are the savior, I'll save you. So whatever you advocate for or go against, you know, this person shouldn't be... Um, doing this or whatever, um, or I don't believe in this. Yes, I can have my beliefs. These are important. But what happens if you get angry about someone else's anger? I'm taking it on. I'm actually um, the very, and I found this um, to be true when I was starting to do environment work. I started to get more upset, more, you know, angry. You know, how can people be so unconscious or disrespectful? And I had to change my thinking because I, I could see I was becoming part of the problem. I, how can you be serviceable in communicating to people about being awake and conscious about the environment if you're angry? 
Someone might argue with me on that one. But when you think of Gandhi or Mandela or Martin Luther King, these kinds of examples, or um, just these great souls in your own life, any hero in your life, they're not afraid to face the situation, but they recognize the enemy. And it's usually not the other. I really believe that to the amount I get disturbed about other people's activity, I'm going to have some degree of that same tendency. I'll say tendency. I'm being careful with my words um, in myself. And when I'm in my most serene, calm moments, I will lovingly be able to recognize how I contribute to the problem by being reactive and upset and angry. Compassion, yes. That gets us out of bed in the morning. But again, in those calm waters, when I'm light and easy, when I trust that everything is happening for me, I will begin to see the um, cause of the disturbance. Events happen and I can remain calm. And actually, if I do remain calm, do you think I would perform better if I have clarity? I can have passion, but with clarity and calm versus upset and anger which state of consciousness would be the most effective and the least waste of energy? Just something to think about. Um, so a little bit on, on having trust in every, you know, the events and the, the lessons, the challenges. And I, you know, I too, I mean, all of us have challenges. If we're too busy, um, my kids, how they're doing, you know, worrying about others, um, worrying about the economy, about the environment, um, and relationships, misunderstandings. And I like to think that all these karmic accounts, whatever the challenge is, I like to think it, but I know karmically it's true. Every negative karmic account, we'll call it like a bank account. So you have positive and you have negative. Okay. There's, and so it's not always negative. Karma is also good, all the good things that happen. But any karma, it comes to say goodbye. Everything that happens, it comes to say goodbye because life is always changing, always flowing. Things are always happening. And when that challenge comes, when that um, adverse situation happens, am I able to bid it farewell? And I'm doing this sort of like respectful uh, namaste or um, thank you for the lesson. And um, then it's goodbye forever. It won't come back. Or the or to be less intense, the situation. Um, I'm gonna tell you a story about, um, it's a, I think it's a, um, a Taoist story of a Zen master, Haikun or Haikun. And maybe you've heard this before, but it's worth telling again. In trusting life events, things that happen. And how this story goes is this very, and it's a, I, apparently it's a true story from what I understand. And he, this uh, very revered and respected uh, sage in his village um, 
uh, and everyone really respected him. Each village would have some some masses, you know, Zen master uh, in their village, you know, a, le a spiritual leader. And um, the next door neighbor's daughter became pregnant. And she was um, so distraught because she was not married. And the family demanded to know who the father was. And the girl said, oh, it's the Zen master Haikun, the next door neighbor, because she didn't want to divulge who the real father was of the, of the baby. And so um, that got the parents really upset. They marched right over um, and the rumors went around and, every, and, and Master um, Haikun said, oh, is that so? And he remained totally stable. He was being accused of fathering the neighbor's daughter's child. And he goes, oh, is that so? And then when the child was born, the father brought the baby over to the master and said, you take care of it. And the master says, oh, is that so? So then he raised the child. He, you know, raised the child with love and care. And um, he became one year old. And the daughter of the father next door became so distraught that she finally confessed to the father that it was the butcher's son in the village who's the father of the child. And here this, this Zen master had been, um, you know, fathering this child, right, for a whole year. And the father comes over and says, ah, we'd like to take the son. He actually, you know, we found out who the real father is. And what does the Zen master say? Is that so? <laughs> and you can hear similar stories like this, you know, where you think it's misfortune, but then as it it's time goes by and reveals itself, you go, wow, if that event didn't happen, I wouldn't be where I am today. Right? When we look back, we can look with appreciation. But imagine having such attention and ease and clarity in the present moment that I accept everything and go, oh, okay, is that so? So that's just a perspective to play with. I mean, if I do that now, when I look back at events, why not do that in this moment? rather than next year or next month. Um, also, you know, when you trust things, I once listened to a senior's class and she was talking about how important it is to trust, even if someone does deceive you, but to not trust that person, to just write them off, does that feel good? Now we can learn about that person that they have a certain tendency and, and I can be aware of that, but how are my feelings with that person? And, and every time I see them, do I get upset inside? Do, does my lake get stirred up, right? They betrayed me. How could they have done that? But everyone has influences and not to justify and all of that. No, but just to listen and learn and to, to trust them. And I had an event that happened to me where um, someone purposely um, did something mean to me by spreading gossip because they didn't want me to be involved in a certain project for whatever reason doesn't matter I don't need to go into it and um and perhaps they felt um threatened by that 
that I would be on this project. And so they just sent, they just said a piece of gossip around and I caught on. Nobody told me, but I could tell. Nobody told me what was happening, but I could tell by the events that occurred what was happening. And I could have been so devastated and hurt. And I and, and this is usually with people you've known for a long time. And um, I decided after listening to this class of a senior, I said, no, I'm going to trust. And it felt so good. I've had this long-term relationship and I don't want to throw that away just because they had fear or however way in the clarity, in the calm, in the ease, I was able to see their fear rather than my hurt totally disturbing my lake. I just remained calm and I said, no, I want to trust this soul. And I, I took it as an opportunity for myself, not that I could change that person or what have you, but I decided I'm going to trust this person. And they're just under the influence of whatever fear. And sure enough, um, this soul could understand, you know, that I wasn't going to buy into the game and that I, I, I see that I want to invest in truth, my truth, meaning love, tolerance, patience, you know, those that's essence that's essential and the story and the why and the how come that's all repetitive yes we can get the facts I, you know I'll, I'll yes i i this is what happened okay i can understand from people's reaction there's gossip going on or whatever and then i realized no i'm going to i'm going to trust this person and that soul, I didn't expect it. I wasn't trying to go change that person, but they melted. It was such an interesting experience. And my faith in that soul and still trusting that soul created even a deeper trust. And maybe parents, any of you who are parents can understand this when perhaps your child did something naughty it's under an influence of maybe wanting to be prestigious with their friends or, you know, doing things because their friends are doing it or um, whatever, they get angry because they want something. But then that I listen with patience and I trust them. And it builds even... Um, more trust in that relationship. I don't know if you can relate to that. Does that sound familiar? So easiness, again, clarity, calm, flow, seeing things for what they are. Listen with attention, not tension. Understand this energy where um, there can be resistance or, you know, difficulties in the challenge, but what's the lesson? How is this going to release this situation forever? And some situations I need to face them, maybe speak up or um, be more patient, be more receptive, and sometimes to have the courage to move on. But I do it with clarity, not with anger or resentment. Okay, and so now this feeling of trust that I trust that everything is happening for me and I trust the other to their capacity so that I can maintain um, good wishes and pure feelings for everyone. Um, so, um, you know, everybody will see things differently and um, the different, they'll have different perceptions about things. And for me, what is essential is love, truth, joy, 
peace, innocence, courage. These qualities bring us together. These are real. This gives energy, it gives life. And um, anger and resentment and greed and all of these things, they are um, at the taking advantage of someone or at the expense of myself, my dignity. And so that wastes energy. So to understand that everybody will have a different perception, a different reality, how they understand things. But if I hold on to what's real, to be essenceful, it's quite um, infectious. People will challenge you because they want you to be real, actually. And that was my experience with my 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 family when I would go to visit them and they challenge you but I would just remain loving and uh, patient with them and um, it really helped in the relationships to build trust in the relationship also too in with life challenges which helps and maybe you pick that up from me is to have some humor you know, and this is what's brilliant about, you know, um, some comedians, those that can sit on the fence and they they see the paradoxes of life. And, um, you know, for example, one thing that I find very funny is, you know, the difference between fiction and reality. Do you know what the difference is between fiction and reality? Any ideas? Well, fiction has to make sense. <laughs> it, it's just these kinds of things that you can laugh at certain situations and it helps us to get the big picture. And this also creates ease. Of course, not the humor that's at the expense of someone, right? Making fun of myself or fun of someone. But but understanding the paradoxes, you know, um, in life and um, the games. And um, again, this helps me to have that attention rather than tension. Um Uh, also, the beauty of um, tolerance. This is something that is amazing. And I had mentioned Gandhi before um, and people like Mandela. And they seem like great figures. Oh, wow, how could I ever measure up to these people? Or, But what I saw in them and, um, is that they were able to recognize the enemy. And like I had mentioned before, um, this was so helpful for me. And I have a family that ha is like half of them are liberals and the other half are conservatives. Okay. And they're voting and the way they um, make decisions are, are based on this. And I took it upon myself to get to know my uncle that was quite conservative. And matter of fact, he was the chair of the Republican Party of Hispanics in Orange County. He also, in his younger days, worked with the Bush family. Now, my father is a liberal and very Kennedy and um, Martin Luther King walks he would take us when we were children. Now, I said, I want to get to know I, my uncle. I just don't want to buy into this game of the other. And one beautiful principle that I learned from my family, I learned this from them, is family is first. So politics is set aside. 
So then I felt it safe that I can, you know, whenever I would go to Southern California, I would always go and visit my aunt and uncle. And I asked him questions. I wanted, I wanted to learn. I, I remained really neutral and I wanted to understand. And as I started to listen to him and hear what he had to talk about, I went, oh my goodness, he sounds just like my father. Two brothers and their, their values and their ethics were exactly the same. But how they went about it was different. And really, it was about the relationship. I think I am not a, you know, clinical psychologist, but just by this relationship um, that I had closely with both of them. And my uncle really felt that love. He just felt he really respected me. And um I respected him and he would say things that I would just sort of, you know, breathe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it took me time to kind of like, did he really say that? Um, but when I would go to his, you know, fundamental truths that work for him, then I could, there was a language I could use that wouldn't offend him or make him defensive and to perhaps offer, a, I don't know, just offer a new perspective that you know not to I don't know just to be part of the conversation and not lose myself and what I believe in but it meant it was a healthy conversation and um it was a really interesting learning for me um and that's what tolerance is tolerance doesn't mean that I have to put up with Tolerance embraces, you know, it, it's an open heart. Um, and so Gandhi was able to overthrow the British government um, with tolerance power because he recognized that the enemy wasn't the British. He, he uh, took a boat all the way to England and um, he knew that people are people. And so he went to the heart of England and told his story to the Brit Britain communities and shared with them. And so by pressure from, you know, the voters or the people of England, they had to leave the country. But that was his belief in the goodness of others. And I love that, this nonviolent means because it keeps you calm and you're not going to always know the answers but i know that when i'm calm and easy in the flow attentive then new ideas will come to the surface and it's that innate wisdom that's our essence that's what's real that's what's eternal that's what's forever. And that is what will serve not only me, but will serve others. So um, I guess the other two is to, to be informed and um, to be able to, like I with my uncle, I wanted to learn from him. And um, to and it's good that you've you know you've come here that this evening to maybe pick up a few gems and I also love to hear from all of you and your journeys. Um, I could even turn off the uh, recording and we could share for a bit. Um, we still have a little bit of time, but um, I want to be able to develop that potential within me, those that, that nurturing aspect within me that I would call that child aspect, that child wonder where I see things fresh, where I'm receptive, where I'm taking things in as if it's the first time I'm experiencing it. 
you know, like a vac- I'm on vacation, right? When you go on vacation, you you take that town or that place where you're visiting in like you're seeing it and you are perhaps seeing it for the first time. Or when guests come to you and visit your city, you know, when a friend or a relative comes and visits you and you show them around, you see how much happiness and joy that they take from everything that is in your city that you just, you know, take for granted. Just like perhaps even our relationships, to take a moment and um, to take in the other as if I'm seeing them with fresh eyes, with wonder, with creativity, like that of, of a child. And we came into this world with that wonder and innocence. But also to the, the um, balance to the child is the wisdom of the master and that we have that innate wisdom within us and to awaken it, to reawaken that wisdom within. And just as I had mentioned those qualities that are eternal, that give life, those qualities that nurture all souls, all people, all beings, for that matter, animals, even elements. When I have respect, it goes a long way when it's the environment or respect for uh, others or respect for myself. These are what are real in essence extraneous and waste disturbs and clutters and creates murky water and i i lose enthusiasm you know oh do i have to do this again you know or why get up this morning <laughs> you know <laughs> same old same old but if i have that master the wisdom of the master and the innocence of the child, the wonder of the child. And when those two come together, those qualities within, when there's peace, then there's cohesiveness, there's wholeness. And I appreciate myself. So that innocence is married with that, to pun, inner sense, right? In a sense of the child, inner sense, inner sense of the master. And it balances, then the master won't deviate into bossiness or arrogance. And the child with the master won't deviate to childishness or, um, you know, reactiveness and, um, demanding or you know tantrums <laughs> so i like to conclude with saying yes to life yes to flow yes to what's real what gives life rather than no this shouldn't be happening and no I, I, you know, um, I don't want you or, or n no, this is, this life is useless or, you know, but yes to life, even though, yes, things are happening and I observe and I'm aware, but if I become part of the problem and become fearful and angry, is that going to help? Am I going to see what's necessary to overcome that situation, to say goodbye to that negative karmic account? So it's sort of a win-win when I say yes to life, yes to flow, yes to attention, 
yes to what's real and it will be effective others will be influenced when i'm never under the influence when i am not subjected to my environment when i choose to be effective and to maintain what's real and truthful and trusting it's like my trust is like that surfboard to ride the waves of change so when i say yes to life i'm an influencer when i say no then i succumb and i'm under the influence So we're at time. Does anyone have any questions? I can pause here. I'll, I'll just say a few words to honor the time that we have together today. And um, just sit comfortably. Let's do this together and have a meditation. Take a nice deep breath. And let go. Be aware of any tension there might be in the body. And just release that tension. And just really relax all the muscles. And keeping attention on the one who is aware, on the self. I'm aware of my environment, the sounds. I'm aware of the temperature. And I'm aware of being, of being aware of being awake. And being aware of that innocence a childlike wonder. I'm aware of my own innocence, loving innocence. I came into this world innocent. And I'm just a traveler. I'm just visiting. I'm here for a certain amount of time. I the traveler am an eternal soul. And I can observe the world around me with fresh eyes as the traveler. Nothing belongs to the soul. I come into this world to experience, to create, 
to enjoy to flow, to allow. To let go. To say yes to life. And this awareness brings stability, calm. I can see things as they are. And I can see into the lake of my mind. And I imagine seeing my own reflection and observing the kindness and the peace that's emanating from my being. And this is the stage of the master. As if the child and the master are seated together on the throne of awareness. And now I come back to the awareness of the body in the room. And I observe the kinds of thoughts that I have and the feelings. How do I feel right now? 